It's good to see you today. We need times of worship like this when we can be together. And if you haven't returned to in-person worship, I'm trying to make a safe place for everybody. And um, you might have heard in the announcements today, we're actually going to a little park um, downtown in the Gable so we can be outside, we can invite others to participate. It's 65 Alhambra Plaza. And if you go to granadachurch.com, there'll be instructions about parking. We have free parking for you. And, and we want to be outside. There's beautiful instrumentation and worship like this. We want to take into our city. And that's the study we're in. It's called For God So Love the World. And last week we looked at the big picture is that word in the Bible is the word where we get our word cosmos. God loves the universe, and everything about it, and he loves our world. And today we're going to talk a little bit more about our city. And next week, as we're going to be in a neighborhood of our city, we're going to talk about how God loves neighborhoods. God came in human flesh. He didn't live a general life. He actually moved in, lived in a specific neighborhood of our world, like you live in a specific neighborhood. So today we pick up that conversation, and our scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read this, maybe familiar, sound familiar to you. This was written by, um, Luke was not one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, but he's someone who came to faith in Christ, and what he set about to do was go to talk with as many eyewitnesses as he could. And he compiled two of our books in the New Testament, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And um, so he, this is the reason we have this information about the birth of Jesus. He went and talked to people, and he researched it, and he wrote it down so that we would know. This is the word of God. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Let's pray together. Father, maybe we've heard these words a thousand times, and we've also heard, for God so loved the world. But Father, um, that needs to come home with us. We can know that you love the world and the universe matters to you. You created it. It's yours. But Father, to dial down into that and to learn that you really care for humanity. You love us. That's a big thing for us to take in when our fears run deep and we're struggling with life and we so much long for the joy of this season. Lord, thank you for Christmas, for this time when we remember and we live again and the joy of remembering your grace in Jesus and we pray together in Jesus' name, amen. I mean, really, how do we talk about these passages, right? We've heard so many times. Uh, another guy who's a friend of mine, we've been in ministry, both of us over 30 years, called me one day and he said, okay, how many Christmases and Easter's do you think you still have left in you? Come on, right? Because what are you going to talk about? We've heard these passages and thought about what it meant for Jesus to be born. And it's like, how do we capture the majesty of this season of what God has done in Jesus? And as I reflected, I thought about an event that happened a couple of decades ago. Actually, a horrible event. It was on March 13th, 1997, that a group of school children from a, um, from a school in Israel were down on a field trip on the border with Jordan. 
and a Jordanian soldier picked up his rifle and just shot at those kids. Imagine the horror of this, killing seven and wounding six others. This amazing tragedy. And I know we've heard a lot about the Middle East and the fighting between Jewish people and Muslims. We've heard a lot about that, but something happened in the aftermath of this, which was really overwhelming. The king of Jordan, King Hussein at that time, was actually in Spain, and as soon as he heard about it, he was on a state visit. He immediately went and caught his jet and flew back to Amman, Jordan, and then three days later did really the unprecedented. He crossed the boundary, and he went into Israel. He went to that little village where that school was and where those children were from, Beth Shemesh is its name, And he went to the homes of every one of those seven families. And he didn't just go to the homes. When he arrived there, he entered into those homes on his knees. He had tears in his eyes. And he apologized to every one of those families. And he sat Shiva with them in mourning. Now, a lot of the press said, oh, he's submitting himself. He's... He's, look at what he's doing to himself. He's dishonoring himself in this because he got down on his knees. But, but the king didn't care what people thought. You see, he, he cared about those people and he loved those people. And when I thought about that, that that's majesty, isn't it? You can actually stoop, you can bow, and and it's the message of Christmas, this God who inhabits eternity, entering into space and time to show us his love and to, to come and be with us. This is the celebration of Christmas, and it's why this year we're talking about for God so loved the world, because we don't want to doubt that now. We want to remember that. We want to dive into and think about what does that mean? Jeff did a great job last week of digging out that verse John 3.16, and this really is a radical teaching in this series. God doesn't hate the world. He doesn't stand against the world. He hates the sin that's destroying people and cities, but he loves the world. And what we learn today is this isn't some kind of concept in the mind of God. It's not an abstract thought or a, a feeling. It's always directed to an object, a particular person, a place, and a time. You see, it's not general at all. It's very specific. The king comes to your house and visits you. It's actually a core teaching of the the message of Christianity. We call it the incarnation. It literally means the enfleshing, becoming flesh, The idea that the idea showed up, the word took on human body like we have, and life appeared, the way came in person. You see, the the Christian faith is real. It's rooted in history. It happened on a day and time. It's not a mythological idea that we tell this time of year. And this is good news for us because we're living lives that that are all too real. We know what that means in this season. And and by the way, we need to see this. We're hungering for the real and palpable and tangible. We want hugs, right? We want to see faces without masks. We we need the touch of friendship. And it's why I love this in-person worship. In the worship team, they're amazing. They're great. It's why we're going into that neighborhood of our city next week. Jesus connects us to reality. He is the one who connects heaven to earth, us to the person of God. As they said, not a religious myth in flesh and blood. And and we can know this love is real for us today. And you say, well, how can we know that? How does God show us that? And that's what I want to look at with you, how, how God directs his love into our world. Now, here we find in Luke, as I mentioned, this explanation of the birth of Jesus. And it's interesting how it's all explained to us. In those days, in a particular moment, Caesar Augustus, this Roman emperor, issued a decree from across the empire that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. We know that Quirinius was governor of Syria at this time, and everybody had to go to their native hometown, we're told, to register. 
You see, Luke tells us what's happening in the world in those days because there's this amazing conjunction of human history, this particular moment which sweeps people along this course in their lives. And through events, those happening so far away, here is God accomplishing his purposes in our world, in the census, in this requirement to register. And I love this about God, right? I mean, he's the God who inhabits eternity, but he's actually working in moments of time. Yes, God loves the world, but not in a general way. He's loving us in each moment. And you know that's true for you? Do you know that God was loving you when you were born? When your mother, when your father held you in their arms? God loved you when you were learning how to walk and on your first day of school. When you were trying to fit in in high school, God loved you then. When you graduated and and you had the joy of moving forward in your life, he was there when you were married, if you got married, and you wondered how well it would go, whether it would work out. And you see, it also wasn't just the happy moments, because as you're reading this text, you're like, wow, this has got to be the worst time in Israel. I mean, really, another country far away is dictating and moving masses of people around. You feel vulnerable. You feel at the mercy of others, this kingdom that is so great. They were defeated, and it seemed hopeless. And the circumstances for Mary and Joseph were painful and difficult. But God's love is present. God is working. Do you believe that? God's love is present in the the moments of your life. Do you know this is true? And by the way, he's not selective about the moments, just the good ones. We're told that while we were still sinners, God demonstrated his love for us and that Christ died for us. And this means God was loving you when you divorced, if you felt your life was being shattered. God loved you when you heard that you had cancer and you You found you were in a battle you never thought you were going to be in. He he loved you when you were pushed out of your job. When that person you loved so much got sick, he loved you when the addiction was getting the best of you, when you hurt that person you loved so much. He, He loved you in each of those moments. He, felt, he loved you when you felt successful and, and shiny and bright, and he loved you when you were on your face in failure, wondering how you could go forward. You see, he loves us when things not just are right, but when everything is going wrong. Brennan, Brennan Manning, who's a priest who, who discovered the grace of God in his own addiction to alcohol, uh, never had children. He married, but he and his wife didn't have children And one day he was with a friend of his who had a bunch of children, and just he was sort of curious. So he asked his friend this question. He said, well, do you have a favorite child? Which of your children do you love the most? And his friend just paused for a moment. And then he said, I I love Mary the most. She was betrayed by her best friend in school, and she's feeling so shattered right now. I love her so much. And then he paused for a few moments and he said, I I love David the most. He's just begun his first job and he feels so insecure and he he thinks he's going to fail and he thinks it'll ruin his whole life if he does that. I I love him so much. And then he paused paused again for a moment and he said, I I love Peter, my son Peter the most. He He's living through that moment when his face is covered with pimples and, and he thinks every, that's all that anybody can see about him and, and that's all he's seeing about himself right now. I, I love him so much. And in that moment, Brennan realized that father loved every one of his children the most and he realized that's the way God loves us. Not waiting for the right moment not waiting for the day we get our lives together and figure everything out, is God loves you. And this is true for humanity. We don't look at this moment and say somehow God, maybe God doesn't love us or he doesn't love us as much because of the crush of events. We we know that he loves us. He loves us at this moment in time. And then Luke tells us this. 
So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. Don't you love that? From, he went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. It's as if he wants to give us a geography lesson. By the way, these places are about 90 miles apart, but Mary and Joseph would have to walk over 100 miles. It'd take them more than a week to do this. It was quite a place. But why are we given this information? Places matter to God. Actually, there was an ancient promise about Bethlehem, and, and not just Bethlehem, by the way. I don't know if you know this, but Nazareth, where, where they were, there was a little place called Bethlehem just a few miles from them. But you see, this was a death, different Bethlehem. It's why it says Bethlehem in Judea that was all the way across the country. Well, why did they have to go there? Why would they have to go to this place? Well, this is the place God promised the Messiah would be born. And both Mary and Joseph come from the line of David. And this is this, the city of David. And what you begin to realize is God is always directing his love to places. You know, our God is a God of place. Specific places matter to him. Though Bethlehem is mentioned in Scripture, by the way, it's five miles from Jerusalem, the great capital city, and at this time, it's really nothing. Nobody would pay it in any attention. It wouldn't matter to them, right? And we know places like that. I don't know if you know, but when Jesus started his ministry, somebody said this, well, Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, there are places that we drive past, right, or fly over. We don't really care about those. And, and we've seen places like this. And in many ways, that's happened with many of our cities. As uh, Christ followers around the world, oftentimes we flee to the suburbs, and the reason, and by the way, this has happened, I'm told, more and more during COVID. And I can understand it. It can be very difficult to live in the city. Life can be more expensive here. It can be more dangerous. It's certainly more crowded. We feel the traffic. But as we heard in the Advent reading, God loves the cities because many people are there. Because many people are in the city. God loves the cities and by the way, some of you have made a commitment to this, this city, the mission of the gospel in this city, and it involves sacrifice and the awareness of that mission. I'm, I'm called here, and I'm meant to live for Christ here in this city. And by the way, I often meet people who are like, oh man, I'm counting the days till I can leave this place. And I'm like, well, I'm not like that at all. Because I know God loves the city, and there's a sense of mission. And so what I tell them this is I say, hey, um, Stay as long as you can. Serve as much as you can. Give as much as you, of yourself as you can in service, as long as you're able to do so, because this is the mission of God. God loves the great cities and also the communities that seem unimportant to God. And Jesus grew up in a place like that. Yet, do you know this? He sought out the great city in the last week of his ministry and to go to the cross out of this love for the city, which God, by the way, has been telling his people about, but they've missed. Here's what God told Jonah. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? It was a pagan city and an enemy city. He said, but should I not have great concern in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. Don't you love that? God loves the city. As you're driving on I-95 and you just see these neighborhoods and you wonder about them, you can know that God loves the city. He loves neighborhoods filled with homes that all look alike. He loves the communities where unemployment is high. He loves those places where the children can't read at grade level. He loves the places where the, land, the, the lawns are all manicured, and he loves the places where there are no lawns at all. For God so loved the world. You see, God's love is present everywhere in our world. It's not limited to the pockets of places where followers of Jesus live. It, it extends to everybody. And you know, the Bible is filled with a theology of places. Places matter to God. And this includes your neighborhood and this city. This is something we so need to understand, to love our city and to work for its healing. But, but do you believe this? 
Is that something you believe? That, or do you look at some places and say, ah, oh, that's God forsaken? Or maybe you look at some people and say that. Or do you believe the love of Jesus is for every community in our world? And that God loves and is present and working in every city of our world. You see, we know these things, but they need to be reinforced in us. And finally, we read this. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available to them. Now, this is remarkable, right? He starts with the Roman Empire, and very quickly he descends to the smallest unit of humanity, this tiny little baby. Now, this is amazing in, in the way that he focuses his lens on what he's doing in Christ. So think of the vulnerability of tiny hands and, and tiny feet and a, and a mother holding her firstborn child. We instinctively know this about babies. By the way, these are the babies born in Granada in 2020. You think God hasn't been giving life and pouring out his love into our world. These are the babies. I don't have a picture of all of them, but this is um, Aveline Francois, and you will see then Eleanor uh, Dawson, and you will see Zara Portella, who I think is actually here this morning, and you will see Luca Seidel, the, the son of Anderson and Leslie. You'll see Cora Larson. You'll see Igor and Anna Ribera's daughter, Amelia. And you will see the Snedeker baby, Ellen Bree Snedeker. And finally, the last one, this is a Cecilia Rain Tunez. She was born on December 2nd. That means just four days ago. Isn't that awesome? I don't know about you. If I see a child, a little baby in public, it's, you sort of, you walk up very gently and there's like a, a, a holiness of this, right? I mean, there's like a, there's a reality to this. It's, there's reverence. And you see, God could have come as a giant earthquake or a, or a fire or a rushing wind that's mighty, but he doesn't. He comes in human flesh. That's what these verses tell us. This is how God personally comes into our world. You see, it's all personal. God loves you. I don't know, I don't, a few years ago, I read this story of an art exhibit that happened at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. It was in 2012 when Marina Abramovic sat in a chair for 700 hours over the scope of three months. Do you know what she was doing during those 700 hours? Something very simple. She sat and looked at people one person at a time. For just a couple of minutes, she looked into their eyes, 1,500 of them. Among them were some famous people like Sharon Stone and Christine Amanpour from CNN and, and a bunch of other people, but anybody could get in line. And let me tell you, people were gathered to watch. Not a word was spoken, but it was so intense to see, to really see another human being and to take the time to do that, that so many of the subjects just broke down and wept. And oftentimes she did too. I mean, it was super powerful. Her ex-husband even showed up and was like, okay, how is that, what, what is that going to be like, right? And you know what the, the exhibit was called? It was called this, the artist is present. The artist is present. What, what happens when God is present and you're looking into his eyes and you begin to discover how personal that love is for you? It's not in general. It is specific. Now you say, well, how can God love me? How can I know this? God loves in person. Listen to what it says. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus came into the world not to judge us. We feel the heaviness of our own sin as Esteban was talking about it this morning. We know that. So he didn't come to judge us he is interested in you. He knows you. He knows your fears and insecurities. He knows the struggle you have with yourself every day, your fears about measuring up and all of the anxious thoughts. And in the immensity of this world, 
He loves you. He's come to you. David marveled at this. He said, Lord, you discern my coming out and my, my lying down. You, you're familiar with all my ways. He says, you are so dialed in to me personally. He knew that God knew everything about him, but this is what he says. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And that's how you can know that you see this interest of God in you that you're just like, wow, this is too much. I cannot take this in. That God would be interested in me in this way. That's the reality. God loves you. He, he knows you. He doesn't love the person you wish you were or hoped you might be at this point in time. He loves you. And you say, well, how can you know that? How can God love us in this moment at this place? Well, in what was told to Joseph before Jesus was born, he was told about Mary. She will give birth to a son and you were to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You see, he will save us. You see, our king stooped deeper than just bowing down at our doorstep. He stooped deeper by being raised up on a cross on our behalf. The God who entered time and space on another day in history, a 24-hour day like this one, was hung on a cross to reveal and to guarantee God's love for us. You see, that we might have fellowship with God and that we might live our lives here to the fullest in him. So let me tell you, despite what's happening in our world right now or, or what's happening in your life or what is left in the trail of your experience or how you feel about yourself, this moment, you can know because of Jesus, God loves you. Now I began by telling you a little story of King Hussein that happened in 1997, but what I didn't tell you at that time is that the king was in his own cancer battle. He was dying, he died within two years. Actually, he was flying back and forth to the Mayo Clinic on a regular basis. And that day he visited those homes. He was asked, why are you doing this? Why take your time to do this? And he answered that in the loss of those children, quote, I feel as if I have lost a child of my own. If there is any purpose in my life, it will be to make sure that all the children no longer suffer the way our generation did. And when I read that, I thought, that sounds like the gospel, right? Of the king saying, my life is meant to change your life and the generations to come. And this is what it means to love. And so that's what we're learning this Christmas season, this time of Advent. The question is, do you believe that God has loved you? It doesn't, I don't think it matters so much whether you believe God loves the world. What matters the most is whether you believe God loves you, that he is for you. And that's why Jesus came into the world, so that we could have that kind of personal relationship with God and identification with him in time and history that, that we might also be able to live in that love in our time, in these moments of history. Let's pray together. Yeah, Lord, we have heard it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Lord, maybe we've heard it too much. We were told that familiarity can breed contempt, but more likely in this case, it breeds us not thinking and seeing what it means to be loved by the God who is Lord over all, who created the universe, and who came into our world. And Lord, we're all in different places here. Some of us are carrying burdens of guilt that are just so heavy from our past. And, and we need to hear, we need to know that you love us, that forgiveness is rich, and plentiful in Jesus. Father, others of us look into the future. We don't know where this is going. We, we don't know how we're gonna live in the days that are coming ahead. Help us to remember that you are the God who has loved us in Christ, and you're also the Lord of history. In the same way you crafted the events of history to bring Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. 
Father, you have told us that you will bring us, you'll bring us home. And so Lord, I pray today that we would realize that we are living in your steadfast love. That it's not that we loved you, but that you have loved us and you've given your son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Lord, help us to see this and to live in it. And we thank you, O Lord, and we pray together in Jesus' name, amen.